the sun beaming. Tyler Gregory Akonma, an aspiring musician who started his career under the rap collective Art of Future, was born on the 6th of March 1991. He was mostly self-taught on the instrumental side of things. He's good friends with Frank Ocean. He hosted a show on Adult Swim called Loiter Squad, and later down the line he would go on to make some pretty kick-ass music albums, all of which will be covered in this video. Okay, maybe except these two, but the six mainline albums, yeah, I'll, I'll give them a shot. Anyways. Before we start, you may be wondering why this is an audio-only review. Well, I look like this, so take that for what it's worth. But also to ask the second question, why am I covering a rapper? It's not necessarily an artist that I am particularly into, and... With some exceptions, of course, but the reason why I'm singling out Tyler in this case is that he's genuinely really great. And yes, while I am going to criticize a few of his older albums with how much they've not aged very well, I could also point out that he is one of the most talented and innovative artists in his field. Mixing so many genres together, whether it's rap, drill, R&B, or otherwise, which then becomes a whole genre onto itself. And I can confidently say that even if he does have some records that I just thought were okay, Tyler the Creator has not made a single bad album. Also the thumbnail looks really cool and I didn't want it to go to waste. Anyways, let's bust for the door, get the job done, and get this party started, shall we? Talk to your wife like that? Oh dear, I seem to have spotted a cut. Good day. Remember when I said that he didn't have a single bad album? Well... First up on the list is the only album of his that Tyler himself said hasn't aged well, his 2011 debut-ish album, Goblin. Now this was his first big venture into the realm of music, and I do mean big. Critics, audiences, music snobs, and the friggin' Atlantic Ocean were all excited to see what Tyler would do for his first studio album. And when it came out, they were all extremely disappointed, citing it as lowbrow boring arrogance. Since then, the album has gained quite the cult following amongst his fans, so I was optimistic as to what this mysterious experiment could be as a fan of his later work only to be surprised by the shocking realization that everyone was right the first time. Now it's not to say that I didn't enjoy any of these songs. She is one of the more tolerable songs on here with a pretty neat synth line and a pretty catchy chorus. So I do consider this as one of his more underrated tracks. Plus, who doesn't love some Frank Ocean? And I'm sad to report that he's in fact 100% human and 0% ocean. Fuck you, reality. Yonkers has an instrumental that's almost iconic at this point, and Troncad just makes me laugh for the reaction it stirred when it first came out, which could almost be said about any track on this album. And it just makes me laugh reading the comments for these things on YouTube, mainly because most of the time the reactions to these songs are just of sheer horror from his later fans. And while we're at it, let's talk about the elephant in the room, the lyrics. Uh. Okay, I'm well aware that he came from a pretty difficult background, so it's understandable why he has these thoughts and wanted to express them through the music he makes, but I would also completely understand if you're having trouble with getting to Tyler's music because of it. To this day, people aren't sure if these are good lyrics or just shock for the sake of it. Especially the discourse surrounding the 213 uses of the hard F word. And no, I am not going to say what that hard F word is. I have my limits, okay? But I'm not here to talk about the discourse, I'm just here to talk about what I think of the lyrics. And I don't think they're good in the slightest. Don't get me wrong, I like the flow of these tracks, and even before Flower Boy, his instrumentation is top notch and fits the tone of his music perfectly. But half the time, I'm not entirely sure if half these lyrics are just to troll, offend, or even provoke people. And when it's happening constantly for a nearly 80 minute album, I feel less shocked and more so bored. 
and it gets worn out really quickly. Like, jeez, man, there's a wide variety of swear words out there, and he sticks to mostly one? Calm down, man, you don't want to get too overly attached to it. Overall, Goblin isn't a good album. At all. Every conceivable part of the album is messy and flawed down to the smallest atom. But in its defense, it has some interesting ideas that would be more fleshed out later on in much better records. So if this had to exist so that we could get Igor, I see that as a fair trade-off. At least he said he didn't regret making the album. That's, that's nice to hear. But this album's still pretty freaking terrible. Wolf Paley robbing him, I'll crash that fucking airplane at that clam juice. A bob is in and stab Bruno Mars in his goddamn esophagus. I don't like that album cover. I know that this has nothing to do with the album itself, but I just can't imagine being on a car ride with a few drunk friends listening to someone's summer mixtape on Spotify, and that shows up on your dashboard. He's probably a serial killer now. We met the mutual friends, and this is where the story of confusion began. A lot of people don't seem to like this one for many reasons that I probably won't get to because everyone else has already gotten to it, but allow me to defend this fun mess for just a little bit. This album's alright. Sonically has the same kind of production as his previous two records, but it also weaves in a few notable jazz inspirations that were partially visible on his previous album, Wolf. But I would be lying to myself if I didn't say that this would only be enjoyed in chunks. Listening to it all the way through, however, is just exhausting. Wait, didn't I say that I was supposed to the Oh yeah, the highlight! Find Your Wings and Blow My Load have some really good production going for it, and I know that it's odd to say, but I genuinely miss when Tyler's songs can go over 5 minutes. Two Seater is also pretty soulful with its production, same with the fourth to final track, Fucking Young. Buffalo has a tribal cry that sounds like a mix between Funky Kong and Rafiki from The Lion King. I don't know why that needs to be pointed out, but when am I ever going to make that comparison ever again? And oh my god! Death Camp featuring Cole Alexander from Black Clips? What an underrated opener! I'm not sure about anyone else in the room here, but this is what Goblin should have been. Also an editor note, I didn't get a chance to uh, bring this up in the scripts, but Kanye West and the Neptunes Pharrell Williams are on here. I don't know what they're doing on a Tyler the Creator album, but sure, I'll take it. And oh look, also making a guest star on here is the abrasive arrogance from Goblin, oh joy. Yeah, it's a little bothersome that that whole arrogance from that album is still lingering, but it's more under control here, so I don't mind all too much. But quite honestly, you're telling me that that album managed to get a reappraisal amongst Tyler fans, but not this? Maybe I'm not seeing it, but... What the hell is wrong with you people? Oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god. Snoopy of the Arctic! Alright, I'm gonna keep this one particular brief because I feel like compared to every other album on this list, I wouldn't even stand a chance of doing this 18 track beast some justice. Yes, this thing is 18 tracks. Go figure. Dude, you want me to do it? Oh yeah. You could kill him. I'm saying, you know, like... But I will say that Wolf is a pretty great album, for the most part. Highlights off of the album include Party Isn't Over, Jamba, Lone, Rusty, Trio 95, and Trashwang, Tyler's very own hip-hop posse cup with a funny name. It was very interesting to see where Tyler wanted to go from here and trying to distance himself from the first two albums as humanly possible. But while some moments have definitely grown on me since my first listen, songs like Awkward, IFHY, Slater, and Tamale still have that goblin musk all over it, which majorly weighs it down for me. The uneven tone of the whole record is set at the beginning with the title track, having these nice sounding melodic, almost R&B-ish synth motifs, and then Tyler busts for the door with a mighty fuck. Don't give me a oh, I forgot how many times I put that in the script. Just put a counter in the corner or something. Don't get me wrong, his rapping, his production, his maturity on how he writes lyrics, it's all really great. But it doesn't quite reach the heights and or paling in comparison to his next three works. 
outside of Cherry Bomb, but seriously, that album needs more love. Go to your classroom, Chris. Teacher, teacher, I'm lost. And our next and final stop on the Tyler, the Creator Tour is the Big Free. And if Flower Boy was about his sexual identity and Eager was his breakup slash revenge album, then this is his traveling album. Surprisingly on the same page here, man. Yeah, I'm so excited to go check out this new matcha store. Released in 2021, Call Me If You Get Lost is probably his most charming record thus far. Probably the first one here that I ended up liking all the way through though. Even if the Goblin Attitude makes an occasional cameo because I guess it's the Will Wheaton to Tyler's Big Bang Theory, it does make a lot of sense with it being about the exhaustion of constantly working 24-7. So it's easier to take because of that, even if he does go a tad bit overboard on the more aggressive tracks like Manifesto or Juggernaut. Safari is probably the biggest sounding track on the album and absolutely rocks it on the recorder. <laughs> My man. And Lumberjack, Wilshire, and Hot Wind Blows of Little Wayne are, dare I say, relaxing? Almost MF Doom-like? Same with Warf Talk. There's a more mellow and somewhat pop sheen to it, and ASAP <gasps> Rocky! ASAP Rocky is on the album! But what I love the most about this album is that it's very laid back and confident. It doesn't need to dazzle you with any big spectacles in order to get your attention anymore. Tyler's already done it. So what better way to celebrate a follow-up to the album that brought him to where he was than just by doing pretty much whatever he wanted? The best example for this is the opening track, Sir Baudelaire, featuring DJ Drama, We the Best Geneva Water. Seriously though, I was really deciding against going to Geneva at first because of the ludicrously high prices, but after listening to this track... <laughs> hey mom! Pack your bags! We're going to the cheese country! God, I love this album. If you haven't listened to it yet, please do. It's an incredible indication on how far he's come since his odd future days. And I'm waiting in anticipation to put this thing on in the family car the next time we're traveling to Geneva. Wait, I don't have a passport. Shit! Police can't come after my Zola. I'm so soft. Yeah, I'm like a flower. All right, this is it. The big one. The phobe stopper. The ultimate choice that I have to make, Flower Boy and Igor. Both albums are sonically innovative, beautifully orchestrated, show Tyler's rapping at its fullest potential, and I would most definitely consider them both as some of my favorite albums of all time. But which one to choose for the number one spot? Well, this one does have a B on the cover. Eager wins. 20, 20, 20, 20 vision. Cupid hit me, Cupid hit me with precision. I... At the time of this album's release, Tyler was still seen as that very lowbrow friend you had in college that liked to smoke weed and tell you about the deeper meanings of 12 ounce mouse. But Flower Boy did something different that no Tyler album did prior. It actually sounded complete? His sound had been pushed to its fullest potential. His lyrics actually communicated his emotions while coming off as a salty blog post. And it shows that we're a long way away from the same Tyler who made Loiter Squad for Adult Swim. Forward drags us into the album's beautifully bleak tone with loosely woven lyrics, dark parallels to real world America, the obsession with material goods, and Rex Orange County. Where the flowers bloom, synth work is phenomenal with a pretty great feature from the rap world's very own body of water, Frank Ocean. The same goes for See You Again and Pothole, and Who That Boy, God, I feel so white, is one of the more abrasive tracks in the album, and huh, what do you know, Aesop Rocky is on here too. I think you're slowly becoming one of my favorite rap artists. And that's all I really have to say about it. It's just a really good album. This is part of a stream of Tyler albums that I would like to call the Honest Trilogy, including this, Igor, and Call Me When You Get Lost, on account of them being the most honest and personal albums he's made to date. And oh hey, speak of the devil, Sure enough, Merlin had cast a spell on the plowman's thumb, and as it grew, so did Tom, until he was a normal-sized boy. Do I even have to say what it is? Do I even have to? I feel like 
Everyone and their lovers, mothers, and sisters have talked about why this album is the Jesus of rap music. And I know there are a bunch of people out there who would tell you that this album is overrated. But I just can't help it. It's just too perfect of an album for me to put any lower. And if I had to choose one where his production, instrumentation, and songwriting is at its absolute best, it would be this one. So, ladies and gentlemen, Igor. Tyler's big coming-of-age album, so to speak, that answers the questions behind the mystery of Tyler's love life and sexuality has been repeatedly analyzed and reviewed for the genius that it truly is, quite possibly to death. And I'd be robbing the attention of other people who've done this album a lot more justice than I ever would. So I will be getting into the finer details behind the album's narrative, though it is a really good narrative. So instead, let's just roll with what I've been doing so far and just give my thoughts on the album instead of treating it like some ancient artifact. Hey, cut me some slack for this one. This was probably the longest segment I had to write for this video, as in two pages worth of praise long. Eager's Theme and Earthquake opened the album in a strong way with themes that are not just intertwined with each other and would eventually make its rounds later on the album and tracks like I Think and Puppet but also make for some pretty great bops on their own to the point where they're both on my summer playlist. Also Playboy Cardi is on this track and who doesn't love Playboy Cardi? Speaking of I think, there's a random name drop of the 2017 movie Call Me By Your Name in this track. I'm bringing this up not just because it's a really good movie about bizarre homosexual romance that doesn't have nihilistic undertone, but also because that phrase will later become the catalyst for other cultural progressions later down the line with a song from an actually gay artist, Little Nas X, of the same name, which I thought was pretty cool. And I know it seems like a no-brainer to mention the production, but something about me needs to because it just sounds so immaculate. New magic wand, running out of time, gone gone, can we still be friends, boy is a gun, what's good, even the 14 second interlude near the beginning is pretty good narratively. But if you're not interested in a mostly pointless filler track, may I suggest Boyfriend off of the vinyl release? Also, yes, I have this on vinyl. Cool, huh? I would also like to mention Best Interest, which was sadly cut from the album. It was mainly because it wasn't finished in time, but you can never really tell by listening to it. It sounds like it would just fit right at home on the album without any issue. All of these are good and all. Spice them up with some malnourishing Geneva water and they would still be as good nevertheless. But you haven't lived until you heard thank you. And I know that I usually say this as a joke, but I mean this in every way imaginable but the whole album would just fall apart without it. An absolute majesty on a production standpoint, thank you is Igor finally accepting the fact that he might never get back together with his lover. And all he could do now is just reminisce on the fact that it was fun while it lasted. Listening to this, you practically become a changed person by the end of it. Tyler, up until this point, had one of the most divisive of discographies, ranging from the highest of highs to the lowest of the lowest of the lowest of the lows. And nobody would have expected for Tyler to come out with not just one of the best rap albums of the decade, but one of the best rap albums of all time. But he did, and I'm happy for him. And that is why I consider Igor as not just my favorite Tyler the Creator album, but the best Tyler the Creator album, and one of my favorite albums of all time. And that's the ranking. Do I have anything else to say? Nope.